Thank you, Asida Buku, for joining us from Emory. Um, your manuscript is outstanding. This concept of failed surgical valves, and you even went into failed towers. What a timely topic. Like, how many patients right now are we talking about this is going to happen to, and what's the future look like? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Graf, for having me and uh, team um, and for the invitation for uh, the uh, paper. It's a great question. We don't know, but we anticipate a lot more than we think. Um, it is um, certainly a little bit daunting and exciting all at the same time to think about what the future will bring 10 years from now, seven to 10 years from now, with our low risk patients and intermediate risk patients who have um, you know, gotten uh, TAVRs over the past 10 years and how we're going to treat these patients down the road when they're TAVR valves uh, fail. Um, I think we have learned a lot from the surgical failed prosthesis. We have learned about uh, coronary obstruction mitigation risk with our basilica procedures. We have learned about uh, how to place valves, how to, how to crack these prostheses to get a, a more effective, a better um, EOA and valve gradients. And I think a lot of those principles will be applied to TAVR, however, or to failed TAVR prosthesis, however, um, the specifics will be different because as you know very well, the way that we place these TAVR valves and the, the implant depths and things of that nature will all come into play. And uh, I'm, I don't have an answer, but I know that we're gonna have to figure out the answers to these questions very soon. Well, yeah, I, I certainly agree. I mean, there's this idea that there's going to be this tsunami of failed TAVR valves. We really have not seen a tsunami of failed surgical valves, but we know that they have kind of a finite lifetime. So let's start with those surgical valves. Today, when you have, you know, a patient who comes with a failed bioprosthetic surgical valve, what's your approach to that patient? So, um, our approach to that patient really always starts and ends with a heart team approach. Uh, we uh, look at the patients, you know, when his prosthesis, uh, his or her prosthesis was placed, how long this valve lasted. Was there, first of all, the method of failure? Is it failing because it's leaking and there's a, you know, uh, a problem with uh, a leaflet, uh, or is it failing because it's stenotic and uh, there's an issue with um, clotting or any kind of early degeneration, or is it a timely degeneration? How old is the patient now? What is their expected life, uh, life uh, longevity or life expectancy at this point? Are they someone who think is who we think is going to need one more valve in their lifetime or more than one? And uh, can we safely get a valve and valve procedure done in them? And what other adjunctive techniques or therapies would they need for us to be able to do a valve and valve, such as, again, coronary obstruction risk, basilica, the size of the valve prosthesis that we can get in, should it be a super inner design or a balloon expandable design? And, uh, you know, how good of a result do we think we're going to give this patient with our valve and valve procedure? And perhaps even more importantly, what is their reoperation candidacy? So are they a candidate for a redo operation now, later? Um, these are all factors that depend on what their current age and uh, life expectancy is and what our valve uh, management strategy is over their lifetime. Um, but yes, those are all questions that we ask ourselves and we discuss in our heart team meetings. And sometimes, you know, th if the patient is young and we think that getting a valve and valve procedure done will buy them five to seven, seven to 10 more years, and then they'll be eligible for operation later. And that is one strategy versus going for a redo operation now. Um, and unfortunately, at least in our center, the patients that we see often don't have a great surgical option. And so hence why necessity is the mother of invention. And we've come up with all the techniques that we do to try and, uh, um, and offer them a strategy that works. 
Well, I certainly want to get into um, the, the basilica technique and how you take us through that. But I want to take one step back before we dive into that. What are your watch outs? So are there certain types of valves that we should be concerned about? You know, the, the people who are reading your manuscript and it's, it's wonderful. I recommend everybody download it because it really does have a step by step of what to do. But when you see these valves and you're looking at them with three mencio, what are your watch outs? And are there particular valves you're like, oh, no, this one's going to be a problem. Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, as you know, and you can uh, maybe uh, help me with your perspective as a surgeon, you know, uh, it seems like the types of valves that we go through, you know, there's there's these waves of valves, just like there, there was a wave of mitral flow valves that we had put in. So that's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about a very uh, sort of concerning type of prosthesis is the mitral flow because of the externally mounted leaflets. And so, and the small, you know, it's, it's overall, design makes it very challenging to treat with valve and valve, but we certainly do see, have seen a big wave of these uh, come through in the past four to five years where um, we have had to uh, fracture them uh, to really improve the effective orifice area. And we have had to do basilicas because of their external, externally mounted leaflets. Um, and, you know, then there's the ones that, you know, you cannot BVF safely like the trifectas, et cetera. And that, that also gives us pause because if it's a very small valve to begin with and we know we cannot uh, do a balloon valve fracture, then the patient is not going to do great. They're still going to be left with a significant gradient and, you know, they're, they're, um, how long their TAVR valve and valve is going to last is questionable. The anticoagulation strategy questionable. We don't know if, you know, these patients were better being on coagulation or not, but we certainly do do it um, in those that can tolerate it. And yes, there's um, a lot of unanswered questions and challenging questions. Well, you bring up some really good points, especially about those particular valves, the mitral flow, the trifecta, these ac externally mounted leaflets are always challenging. You know, my least favorite valve to do a valve and valve is probably a freestyle root because you just can't see anything. And only, I think actually only worse is a homograft because not only can you not <laughs> see anything, it's just calcified everywhere. So you bring some really good points. Um, you know, you are one of the experts in Basilica this leaflet modification strategy. Talk to me about what it was like to learn that strategy and, and about which patients, when you when you assess their CT scans, should have leaflet modification. Great, so I had the privilege of learning this during my training. Uh, and this is, um, I think it's one of the most complex procedures that we do in the cath lab. And it really, um, it's, it helps to do more than a few because there are a lot of steps. And I think trying to learn the steps is challenging enough and then troubleshooting the steps if any one of the steps goes wrong can also be challenging. And so I think it's um, definitely very helpful to have had the ability to do a lot of cases under under uh, supervision and uh, the training of the people that, that invented this procedure. Um, but basically it all starts with a CT work up in trying to see which patients are at risk for threatened coronary obstruction. We know that uh, acute coronary obstruction is a very morbid and, and um, truthfully, you know, one of the deadliest conditions in the cath lab. Even if you can salvage it, the patients don't do well. They're, you know, their mortality in the hospital is more than 50%. And they're, you know, this is something that we try to prevent and not have to treat after the fact, because, uh, as you know, you know, uh, trying to treat it after it has obstructed will really lead to persistent mor morbidity. So um, starting with a CAT scan, we measure the coronary heights is the first step. So any coronary that is less than 10 millimeters high takeoff is uh, something that flags um, concern and, and gets our attention. Then we proceed with measurement of the valve to STJ and the valve to coronary uh, numbers and the valve to SDJ. Typically, we want at least two millimeters so that there's some flow coming from above into the SDJ. The valve to coronary, we say four to five millimeters. Certainly, you know, less than five millimeters is a concern. And especially with the externally mounted leaflets, you have to also account for that extra millimeter that that leaflet is outside of the valve cage will give you. And then, really, the key is to um, 
simulate a, a virtual valve and look at how this will sit inside of the surgical prosthesis and what these measurements will be like realistically with a virtual valve in place. And you can play with the size of this because certainly as we know, you know, uh, we don't always get the, depending on how much post dilation or BVF we do on the surgical prosthesis side, we don't always, we cannot always get a 23 valve to be 23. Sometimes it will be constrained based on what the true inner diameter of the surgical prosthesis will be. And so there's a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, or, or maybe I like the word playing uh, with the virtual valve in, in the uh, CT modeling where you really try to make measurements and plan your implant based on what the patient's anatomy is like. And even depth by one to two millimeters can make a difference. And this is what we do. We just uh, very carefully plan it. Then we plan our basilica angles uh, because this will be, you know, lining up your catheters in two orthogonal views to be able to cross at the base of the leaflet and get as big of a split or a splay as you can get in that leaflet to really allow for more blood to get through is also very important. Mm -hmm. So uh, we get our angles, we know where our position is. Sometimes the surgical prosthesis, as you mentioned, the freestyles, you know, and others can be very calcified or there can be a leaflet tear or leaflet prolapse. It makes it really difficult where half of the uh, surgical prosthesis leaflet is, is prolapsing into the LVOT. So being able to traverse that leaflet can be very challenging. And these are all things that we want to be prepared for and plan for ahead of time and not be surprised in the lab. So we, this procedure, you know, uh, more than half of it happens outside of the cath lab. And then we go in the lab and execute the plan that we had really envisioned uh, during during the CT planning phase. And um, we get a lot of help from TEE, uh, trying to really understand where we are on the leaflet. Sometimes, again, traversing on the leaflet can be really challenging if there's a lot of calcium because it can skive on the calcium as our electrified wire tries to get through. And then we have also done balloon assisted sometimes splay of the leaflet where you cross the leaflet and then you put in a coronary balloon to try and make a bigger hole and splay it even more um one time we've even done shockwave or lithotripsy assisted uh you know uh leaflet splitting again calcium is your worst enemy and we encountered this a lot in all of interventional cardiology and structural but also in these failed surgical processes so that's sort of in a nutshell all the things that we look at as we plan this procedure and uh, try to be as methodical about it when we're in the lab as possible. Well, thank you for that. That was a wonderful explanation. And again, I recommend, um, you know, for anybody watching this who wants more information, downloading um, the, the manuscript, it, she goes through everything in the manuscript step by step. And so it's a really good guide to, to how to do this, not only the analysis, but also what's needed to do the basilica. So as you, as you look ahead, um, you know, you, you mentioned how challenging Basilica is. You said it's possibly one of the most challenging things you do in, in the lab. So what is it that you need as, as we think of, you know, failed surgical valves and if Basilica is our only option right now, as you project in the future, 10 years, what do we need in order to make this easier so that, you know, we're not talking about the most challenging thing to deal with mm -hmm. a failed surgical valve or failed, worse yet, a failed TAVR. Uh -huh. Yeah, these are all the questions that keep us up at night at this point when we put our valves in. Um, what do we need? Well, we need to individualize implants as much as we can to a patient's anatomy. We need to take into account, you know, we have gone from implanting all valves, you know, 60, 40, 70, 30, or 80 to whatever. Each center has their own set point. Um and then we have gone to planning them really high to mitigate the risk for pacemaker, which we know uh, patients, especially younger patients, don't do great with. Um, and now I think we're going back and making all these measurements and trying to decide, well, in this patient, if coronary access is needed for later or if a second valve is needed for later, where should I put my first platform so that I can facilitate the next and the next potentially after that? Um, we know from the Sweetheart Registry that you know, some of these patients are not going to need a third procedure, but most of them will at the very least need a second procedure. And some, certainly those 50 to 65 for whom 
surgery should strongly be considered, but that's a topic that, you know, we don't have time to go into at this point, but those patients that we do TAVR, they will potentially need a third procedure and that, that will be really challenging. And so just in the same way that um, in the surgical world, the newer uh, bioprosthetic valves are being designed with this in mind, I think the TAVR valves are, are going to be the same. And we're already starting with the, you know, FX Pro commissural alignment and, and court being very mindful of these things. And that is what we need. We need our next generation valves to really be designed with second and potentially third implants in mind, as well as we need some more dedicated equipment so that we are not nesting catheters within catheters and wires in the lab. Uh, the way that we currently do basilicas is with all equipment that is not purpose for this procedure, but that we have purpose for it. And, and sometimes this requires extra steps that make it longer and more challenging. And so hopefully dedicated devices will be in the making and will make this procedure safer, easier, and more um, amenable to widespread use. I think you're so spot on with that. It's there's there's so much, you know, you think about Taver being 20 years old, but Taver failure is relatively new because we implanted those valves in octogenarians and nonagenarians who the valve outlived the patient. And so it's just now that we have to be thinking about someone's lifetime management for their second valve and third valve. And so your point is so well taken, taking their initial pre-TAVR CT and saying, okay, what I'm going to do today, if this fails, what are going to be my options down the road? And even knowing that we'll have new valve platforms, being able to build on that and say to your patient who's in front of you, okay, I think you're going to have these options down the road. So important that you're already keyed into that and thinking about this lifetime management. So in the last few minutes that we have, because one of the things that's really unique to your manuscript is this discussion about Basilica, and you've, you've talked about how challenging it is. And so somebody who's not doing Basilica right now may pick up your manuscript and say, I want to try this. What's your recommendation for those teams who say, we want to add this to our armamentarium? How does somebody get into this game? Um, great question. We do get a lot of questions and requests from um, other teams that want to learn this. And I think these are going to happen more and more often as uh, we see more and more of these patients needing it, especially the TAVR and TAVR patients. And um, there is some support from industry to get proctored for these cases. We do offer some courses here at Emory and also always welcome folks to come and shadow and, and, uh, learn while we're doing these procedures. And um, I personally believe that this is not the kind of procedure that you watch one video of it on YouTube or TCTMD Gold, and then you can go and do the next one. Um, I think truly understanding the CT analysis and the anatomy behind it and truly, you know, understanding where you can get into trouble is really important. And you get, you learn that from, uh, watching cases and being proctored. And that's what I think the current strategy has been. Um, and we are happy to uh, speak with anyone that is interested in learning about this procedure on how to do it safely and how to prepare for it safely. And uh, we're happy to help anyone that has um, interest or that needs our help. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for your time today. Your paper is so timely as we look into the future. This is going to become an even bigger problem and staying on, on, on the front end of the technology. Um, thank you for your contribution to this work. And uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, everyone.